more speed, and as you're picking up more and more speed, and if you do that at a uniform rate, that's constant acceleration. In the case of gravity, if I uh, drop something, uh, it's accelerating. The, the thing that you drop is going to accelerate because it starts off at rest, and then as uh, time goes by, it's going to pick up uh, equal increments of speed in equal amounts of time. So in the first second it picks up a little speed, and the next second it picks up another equal amount of speed and so forth. And that was, that's what we mean by acceleration. So acceleration is the rate of change of speed, just like speed is the rate of change of position. So these are related quantities, but they're very distinctly different. Interesting to note that even NIST had some trouble with that concept, so don't feel bad. What we're going to do, we're going to go ahead and play, we're going to go right through to the second one. This will be eight minutes, and when we come back, these phone numbers here, 503-288-4442 and 503-288-4448. As soon as we come back, you can call in, and we'll talk for the last 20 minutes about anything you want to talk about, 9-11, what we've talked about today, or the David Chandler video that I'm about to show. This is part two of a three-part thing. Here we go. I was originally going to make a two-part series on the NIST tech briefing because um, there are so many implications of their admission of free fall. However, I got sidetracked in the process of uh, making part two, and I was curious to know how did NIST go about uh, doing their measurement. Like they got an erroneous measurement from which they could claim that it took 40% longer than free fall even though it's obvious just by looking at it that it's close to free fall, and with a measurement you can see it's pretty much right at free fall. So how do they do this? I'm just going to let this video speak for itself. Uh, this is how I tracked down the way NIST uh, did that measurement. Part two of this series was going to be an exploration of the significance of NIST's admission that World Trade Center Building 7 underwent a period of free fall acceleration. That'll have to wait for part three. After suggesting in part one of this video that John Gross's method for determining the time of fall might constitute dry labbing, in other words, falsifying measurements to support a predetermined outcome, I got curious to know exactly what event he picked to start the clock. The measurement is a little tedious, but the result is very significant. That's often the way it is in science, so stay with me on this one. Let's start with John Gross's explanation of how he determined the time of fall. By the way, you might recall this was not the question he was asked, but it is the answer he gave. Uh, our calculation was uh, based on the amount of time from the uh, top of the parapet uh, to fall till it uh, disappeared from view between the two buildings uh, seen in the uh, video. Uh, that uh, uh, time was uh, established from the uh, uh, video uh, by a uh, single frame. Um, um, search of the of the uh, time, so that was down to one thirtieth of a second, um, and then we did the same thing for when the top of the parapet uh, disappeared. Uh, we found that um, that time to be uh, five point four seconds. To identify the point he picked as the start of collapse, we have to work backward. The ending point of his measurement was when the roof line came down to the level of the twenty ninth floor. In our video, there's a structure on the roof of a foreground building that lines up with the 29th floor of Building 7, so it's easy to identify. I imported the video into a measurement program called Video Point, which has a frame counter, and step forward to the frame where the roof line lines up with the foreground marker. That's frame 178, counting from the first frame of the video clip I'm using. At 30 frames per second, 5.4 seconds comes out to be 162 frames. Subtracting this from frame 178 brings us to frame 16. So let's go back and see what's happening at or about frame 16. I put a red mark on frame 16, so as it goes by, you'll recognize it. Let's go back to the beginning and step through this section of the video. Watch for the beginning of the collapse. This is frame 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 
16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, and 30. We're up to frame 30. Did you see the collapse begin? I didn't. Try rewinding the video a few times. It's pretty boring. There's not the slightest hint of any collapse until frame 40. 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70. There's a tiny motion of the corner of the West Penthouse at frame 40. Then there is no more motion until about frame 46. Note that the motion of the penthouse precedes the movement of the roof line. There is no measurable movement of the roof line until frame 46. That's a full second beyond frame 16. Even then, there isn't any progressive ongoing movement of the roof line until about frame 60. By then, we're back to just over 3.9 seconds of collapse time, or in other words, the onset of freefall. The only rationale I can see for choosing frame 16 to start the clock is to make the measurement come out to exactly 5.4 seconds agree with the prediction of NIST's collapse model. But what if I'm wrong? What if they did see some tiny movement on a clearer version of the video? That tiny movement, whatever it might have been, did not last. It would have had to have been a glitch, and the scientists at NIST would recognize it as a glitch, because there's no measurable difference in the height of the roof line for the next 20 to 30 frames. What can we conclude? You can draw your own conclusions, but I think it's pretty clear the whole idea there is any kind of real 5.4 second collapse interval is a fiction. It's a crude fabrication, and the three-stage collapse sequence is pseudoscience in the service of an ongoing cover-up. In part three, we will return to the central question. In conceding freefall, what has NIST actually admitted? The measurement I did in part two of this video is how I actually determined when the start time was. However, it's not very graphically appealing. I f what I did later was I added a clock to the video sequence. I actually uh, selected out just those 5.4 seconds by themselves, and I did a separate run uh, just so that you can actually see what this timing really looked like. Uh, so let's watch that now. In part two of the video series, WTC7, NIST finally admits freefall. I look at NIST's claim that Building 7 took 5.4 seconds for the top of the roof line to descend to the level of the 29th floor. I wanted to address the question, what was going on when the NIST team started their clock? The answer, not much. The video I created at the time showed my actual process of discovery. I stepped through the video and counted frames. I have since created a more graphic illustration of the famous 5.4 second interval. This time I have added a clock to the frames. Each full cycle marks one second. Here is the 5.4 second interval. Here it is again in slow motion. Notice that the building doesn't start falling right away. The flagrance of the deceit is most apparent when the video is run backward in slow motion. See if you can anticipate when the clock should have started for a fairer timing. How about now? Maybe now? No, the clock was started a second and a half before the corner of the building started to move and about a second prior to any noticeable movement of the penthouse. There is nothing subtle here. This is the measurement NIST used to compare to claims that the building came down at freefall. 
Whatever they might claim was happening at their starting point, it had nothing to do with the rate of fall of the building. Okay, well, um, if you're interested in watching more of this uh, David Chandler video, you're in luck because I've got four scheduled play dates where this DVD will play in its entirety. Um, if you'd like to write them down, I didn't, ha I didn't have time to make a CG for this, a graphic, but starting um, day after tomorrow on the 7th, that would be Monday, I guess that's Monday, yeah. Uh, Monday at 7.30 on Channel 23 will be the entire David Chandler DVD. It's an hour and 43 minutes. Um, Wednesday at 8.30 on Channel 22. This is PM. And uh, then a couple more weeks, it's the 15th of February, uh, which is uh, Monday again, I think. or I'm not sure. Anyway, the 15th on at 10.30 on Channel 23. And the last one scheduled is uh, ten, on the 18th, February 18th, at 10 o'clock, Channel 22. Now, the phone lines are open, so if you'd like to call in and make a comment, now's the time. And uh, in the meantime, uh, we've got a, a, a story here that I don't have a graphic for, but a WikiLeak on the U.S. and Al Jazeera. Okay, Al Jazeera is one of the top news sources for the Arab world, and uh, they keep giving points of view that doesn't match up with our State Department's wishes, and so the U.S. constantly harasses, you know, covertly. The United States has had it in for Al Jazeera at least since 2000 when the Qatar-based news network began reporting on Israel's harsh, harsh treatment of Palestinians during the in, in, Intifada and a year later covered the start of U.S. war making in the Middle East. You get that? U.S. war making. It wasn't somebody else making this war. U.S. war making. Anyway, um, during the Iraq war, U.S. planes bombed the Al Jazeera station in Baghdad and killed one of its correspondents in what was clearly uh, appeared to be an attempt to silence the network. And it, of course, remember the, oh, we got a phone call. Uh, remember the uh, journalist staying in that hotel and everybody knew that it was filled with journalists, and yet they fired a tank round at it and killed one of the reporters there. Okay, we got a phone call. They fired at it. I hear you. Okay, we got a phone call. Hey, turn off the TV in the background. Turn off. Turn the you. sound down anyway. Hello, caller. Are you, there? <laughs> are, are you there? Hello, caller. Oh, hey, I thought you were, uh, okay, I wasn't the, uh, <laughs> okay, never mind. He didn't tell who was up. Oh. Can you hear me now, okay? Yeah, I hear you fine. I can't hear you at all. Oh, you got to turn up my microphone for him. Problems. If you can hear me, here's my request. Okay. Is to please put the, uh, videos that you're talking about to put them on uh, channel 11 on the can so people out in the other counties can catch them. Yeah, the only way I can do that is when it's the live show, and that's why I'm still showing these clips. Um, the when, All the reruns are on 22 and 23. So but I, that's, only, that's only if you live in Portland. If you live in one of the other counties, you can't get it on the can then. Yeah, I know. I have a friend in Oregon City who never gets to watch anything unless I, unless it comes out on 11. Hey, by the way, just for your technical advice there, I called on the 4442 number and it was busy, so I assumed there was a caller ahead of me, and then I called on the 4448 to make this request. So I assumed that was somebody else that had picked up the phone because uh, nobody had told me I was up yet. So, oh, okay. Uh, you, you might tell people from now on that you're second in line or you're first in line, et cetera. You know, have your call screener do that. Plus, sure. I can't hear, I can't hear, I, now I can hear you over the phone. Oh, okay. Yeah, we just but, didn't have that lever, lever flipped or whatever, so sorry yeah. about that. Yeah, but anyway, uh, so there's no way we can see it out here in the other counties then? Uh, no, but on, if you go to the uh, uh, Scientists for 9-11 Truth website, which is David Chandler's website, okay. um, you can watch all this for free. Okay. I don't have a computer, but I'll, um, 
oh, okay. work on that then. Well, then the other thing is, if you want to come down here, I'll give you a copy. Oh, okay. <laughs> and and I'll be down here again two weeks.